I think for a lot of people, the tales of Ba Sing Se is that one random episode in book 2 that just decided to make you cry like a baby. Because, well, that's just what it does. But I think equally many tend to overlook the larger narrative structure of the episode that makes that entire emotional roller coaster so incredibly powerful. Even in very, very broad strokes, the episode exists in what I describe as a almost limbo state. Appa is still missing, the message to the Earth King is still pending, the invasion plans as a whole are still up in the air, Zuko and Iroh too are in the city, but we are yet to cross paths, and so on. Everything in this episode operates in that weird liminal period, which I think too plays into that odd sense of peace. A trait that is actually not that common in Avatar. And I mean, of course, let's address the elephant in the room. The structure of the episode itself with the Tales format is also one we have never seen before or since. This type of scattered storytelling never appears neither in Avatar nor in Korra. But before we get to how that too shapes our perceptions of what's to come next, I think it's important to also briefly talk about the substance of the episode on a very, very macro scale. In the year 2024, the word filler is thrown around a whole lot, and importantly, often with a very negative connotation. Thing is, in a series like Avatar, much of what we see, especially super early in Book 1, can easily be called quote-unquote filler, for the simple reason that the show was episodic with a very loose overarching story. So, if you really wanted to, sure, you can call at least parts of this little slice of life-like episode pure filler. But personally, I think that would be, number one, just downright criminal, but number two, just really selling it short with it planting our characters in situations we probably couldn't even imagine seeing them in. The tales of Toph and Zuko, for example, are all about pushing them out of their comfort zones, right? But okay, we'll have plenty of time to delve into all of that later on. What I more so want to talk about on a very macro level is that transitionary period that this episode is in. Much like the larger story going from those loosely connected adventures to a more focused and linear narrative, I also find it really interesting how this episode is not just an independent story, but the episode itself is made up of even smaller bite-sized independent stories. Just like we, the viewers, operate in this liminal space of still eagerly awaiting to see Appa again, the show too, in a very structural way, leans into that in-between period of the episodic nature of Book 1 and the far tighter narrative of Book 3, with this sort of format deliberately focusing on these small stories. It's not just that the Tales format is this sort of slice of life where nothing super big happens. It's also the fact that those stories take place in what is already a transitionary period for the show itself. I think by having this perfect mixture of the not at all connected stories of book 1 and the laser focus on the characters like book 3, we just get this sort of reminder of where all the characters stand right before they become pieces of a far greater puzzle. And as a result, it does feel like this oddly peaceful but also oddly anxious in-between period. If you've seen my video on Aang, I talk a little bit about it there already, but there is a genre in anime and manga called Iyashuke. Probably butchered the pronunciation, but when translated literally, it means healing. Stories there usually focus on the more mundane challenges of life, nature, and generally lower stakes stories to soothe and heal the audience. And while you could spend hours arguing about the definitions and what does and doesn't fit in the genre, I think Mushishi is the most appropriate example of what I mean. First off, if you like the Swamp episode and Aang's Spirit World shenanigans, watch Mushishi. You will love it. But the series as a whole deals with these small bite-sized stories that, while often quite sorrowful, still have that bizarre sense of just being at peace. It does often get a little bit spooky, sometimes a little bit sad, sometimes a little confusing, but it still feels oddly soothing. And that is exactly how I would also describe the tales of Ba Sing Se. It marks the final, truly peaceful moments before the macro story of the invasion takes front stage. It challenges the characters in often unseen ways, but also heals others. All of this comes together for a truly beautiful and ever so slightly emotionally manipulative episode about different forms of loss and what that entails. The first of the tales follows Toph and Katara, which already loops back to what I mentioned earlier with the challenging characters in unique ways. Not only is it the only tale to feature two characters, but it also pairs up Toph and Katara, a duo that is notorious for butting heads over their, well, perspective on life really. Katara is always tidy and organized, Toph is nonchalant and somewhat chaotic. Katara is often likened to a mom for the group, Toph wants to deliberately escape her parents' as shadow. So pairing them up for this little day trip already plants us in a situation we normally wouldn't see. Throughout their little spa session, we see Toph going from fighting back tooth and nail to actually enjoying it. It's a small story of her and Katara just finding common ground. 
something that would come into focus again later in Book 3. And the same goes for those rando girls calling out Toph on their way back. Initially, Toph plays along with their little funny ha-has, only to then clap right back and give them a piece of her mind. Just like Toph found common ground with Katara, Katara steps in Toph's direction, with her response to being very retaliatory. It shows us that, despite their occasional differences and conflicts, Team Avatar is still a single unit, and once one of their own is hurting, they will all set aside their differences and come to their aid. Again, just like we'd see in The Runaway. On top of that, it also reinforces Toph's very stoic worldview, with her just saying that she doesn't care what she looks like or what others say, saying that she's confident in her own skin and that's all that matters. Sure, hearing harsh words does still hurt in the moment, and the entire blind bandit persona is also a pretty clear rebellious act to carve out her own personality. But at this stage in her life, she knows who she wants to be and she has moved out of that box her parents had put her in. It is a story of knowing yourself, being comfortable with yourself, but still being able to find common ground with someone very, very different. Toph is not the type to get makeup, and in many ways, she even hates just the thought of it since it reminds her of the life she left behind. But at the same time, she is willing to make compromises even if it means stepping out of her comfort zone. It is a very low-key story that I think is deliberately planted there to disarm us a little bit to make us lower our guard as to what we should expect in the rest of this episode. That's obviously not a dig at Toph's story. Self-image is a very painful subject, and there is also a form of loss in terms of her family connection, that much is true. But her story isn't about wallowing in misery or brooding over what the girl said. No, it is one of stoicism. Right away, she stands up for herself, which just establishes the sense of, these will be bite-sized stories with quick resolutions and will likely have relatively little stakes. And that is precisely when we drift into the tale of Iroh. Before we even talk about his story here, I think it's extremely important to contextualize who Iroh really is. Looking back, and even on a first viewing, Iroh is just about the most lovable father figure and mentor that you could probably ever write. Everything from his care of Zuko, even in banishments, to his seeming complete 180 during the Siege on the North, to his usual tea antics to his brief conversations with Toph. Everything about him is just pure good, right? Well, not really. Because as much as I think we don't want to admit it, Iroh was once a part of the thing we are currently trying to stop. He laid siege on Ba Sing Se for 600 days. Almost two years, non-stop. Even if he never got into the city itself, I mean, 600 days, that is tremendous human cost. He was an incredibly dangerous general, I mean, he was meant to be the Fire Lord. Not just that, he is also a part of the White Lotus, which, if you read the Kiyoshi and Yang Chen novels, is not just a group of Pai Shou enjoyers. They often get into some very, very shady dealings. And I think it's in knowing that context that his story here is just elevated to incredible heights. I think the vision of taking Ba Sing Se, turning out to be entirely misunderstood, is the perfect encapsulation of what Iroh's life turns out to be. Everything he does is not just an act of purity. No, he is desperately trying to make sure that others don't lose sight of their true paths, just like he himself did. I think that is precisely why he always cared so deeply about Zuko. He was largely a mirror image. He saw Zuko speak out against the Fire Lord because he didn't want to sacrifice people, but that literally got him burned. He doesn't want Zuko to be broken down and turn out the same way that he did in that dark, dark stage of his life. So what he does is just try to mentor Zuko and try to repay the damage he himself inflicted upon the entire world. Even the smallest of things like adjusting the Moonflower. After losing everything, he begins to appreciate the little beauty in this world. He buys a picnic basket saying that it's for a very special occasion. In turn, very much making it a Chekhov's basket and just planting that thought at the back of our minds. We also see him already sing a more upbeat version of Leaves from the Vine the little doll of the Earth Kingdom soldier just readying us for what's to come. He tries teaching the kids with a ball a lesson, saying to admit their mistakes, again, readying us for what's to come. But once again, it also disarms us as we see this goofy Scooby-Doo-esque chase. He even helps out a literal thief, just saying that he doesn't look the type and ends up helping him, yet again dropping one of his very iconic lines of, while it's always best to believe in oneself, a little help from others can be a great blessing. Which again, ties right back into Zuko's story, but I think more importantly, Iroh's own story during the war. With no one left by his side, he just fell apart, and it's only alongside Zuko that Iroh found some level of peace. 
So with all of those nice little acts of kindness out of the way, he walks to the lone hill, unpacks the basket, and simply mutters, If only I could have helped you. The most tragic thing about all of this is that Iroh would re-experience this exact pain all over again with Zuko in Book 3. We of course know that eventually it all ends in smiles, but for Iroh, it was a journey and a half. What I think hurts the absolute most about this episode, no matter how many times you watch it, is that while Iroh was always a very introspective character, more often than not, Peep was also pretty goofy. I mean, just a few minutes ago we saw him chased around in comedic fashion, right? But I think it's exactly because of all of that disarmament that we reach this hill and slam into a cold, cold wall. If Toph's story was one of not looking back and embracing who you are, then Iros is of the deepest, deepest regrets. With those simple words of, if only I could have helped you, everything we just saw is immediately recontextualized to have rather been a deeply regretful and desperate attempt to make up for his past. Those were not just random acts of kindness. No, he is trying to help the very people who are suffering because of his war. To put it in a more abstract form, Ba Sing Se is no longer the city that he couldn't defeat. It is the city that never fell. Iroh's tale explores the somewhat paradoxical situation where you have it all, but you can't do anything. Just like incredibly wealthy people often find themselves in the pits of loneliness, Iroh is one of the strongest people we've ever seen. But in the face of death, he is completely and utterly helpless. No amount of strength, no amount of kindness, nothing could ever bring his son back again. So while his own life might be tainted by that regret, he now just does everything he can to make sure that others never end up in the same position and pursue the goals that they were always meant to. Just like Zuko, just like that thief Masur lad, just like Toph, and just like everyone else who has had the pleasure of sharing a conversation with Iroh. And as much as I don't want to talk about it because, well, I just don't want to make this little goofy video painfully sad, but Mako's performance of Leaves from the Vine is just the most tragically beautiful book into this little tale. That warm embrace of the setting sun falling over the hill as his voice just cracks beneath his tears. And the lyrics contrasting the beauty of those fragile leaves and the horrific hope that that little soldier boy does indeed come marching home is just I don't think there really are words to describe the sheer emotional weight of that short, simple song. I think for Iroh, as well as I imagine many of us watching the series, it just means so, so much. Anyone who has sat on that hill will know the desperate plea, the desperate wish that they could have taken that pain, taken that burden away and carried it for them. But you can't, and you will never be able to. Alright, we're all good? Not really? Well, great, because I think that's exactly why Aang's tale serves as the follow-up. Remember what I mentioned with the different tales covering the emotional spectrum? Well, I think Aang's story is meant to be that bit of catharsis right after the emotional devastation that was the tale of Iroh. In broad strokes, Aang's story isn't exactly a happy one either, with him just still desperately trying to search for Appa. Don't forget that air bisons are supposed to be lifelong companions. So I think at this point, Aang is not just questioning his abilities and responsibilities as the Avatar, but he now also finds himself asking whether he's even a worthy air nomad. Though unlike Iroh, where it's those final moments that will make you start bawling your eyes out, Aang's story more so embodies that healing angle I mentioned earlier. Everything he does is still with the hopes of finding his flying buddy. But in pursuit of that, much like Iroh, he wants to help those in similar positions and so he ends up constructing the new outdoor zoo. We get a visit from everyone's favorite cabbage merchant, which is also the last time we see him by the way, remember the liminal space we operate in. We see a little bit of controlled chaos, but all in all, the conclusion is a happy one. He hasn't found Appa, that much is true, but there is still hope, conveyed by those three little rabaroos popping up in the pouch. It's not a blunt smash cut from the devastation that is leaves from the vine to a wholly happy story where all is right in the world. Rather, it is a smooth transition from that sad regret to a still somber but positive story of healing. He may be incomplete without Appa, but there is new life all around him. Life that too is in need of aid, just like he himself and just like Appa. The tale of Iroh conveys the powerlessness in the face of loss, while Aang's conveys hope. What is a very blunt transition, however, is the one we get to Sokka. We've now all calmed down a little bit and we are sitting there with still a tearful but a smile. And that is precisely when the episode turns on its head and we get what is easily the goofiest story out of the bunch. In classic Sokka fashion, he somehow finds himself in a haiku battle of utmost intensity. While the whole thing is played off for laughs and doesn't really linger on any explicit form of loss, 
I think it does perfectly convey Sokka's personality and really broader narrative. Outside of a few select situations where he does indeed act like a bit of a buffoon, notably Kiyoshi Island, Sokka is quite the social chameleon. He immediately finds common ground with the Mechanist, he later takes charge of the entire siege preparations in the Northern Water Tribe, even smaller things like managing to draw out emotion from Toph during the whole runaway debacle or even his famous Wong Fire disguise. No matter what situation you put Sokka in, chances are he'll be able to fit right in. On top of that, as much as he is often the comedic relief, Sokka is also a certified megabrain, with him and, again, the mechanist figuring out the whole rotten eggs, then putting together the entire invasion plans and quite literally designing a submarine. That said, he often gets up in his head and sometimes just a little bit overconfident and fails in the very, very last stretch. Just like we see here, as well as with his big invasion plan presentation. But what makes Sokka special is that most of the time, he doesn't let those moments get him down, and I think that is the message here. He finds himself in an awkward and uncomfortable situation, somehow manages to stumble through it, but even if he ends up failing at the end, he still makes it a learning opportunity. In many ways, I think it's a spin on Toph's story. If she can't just avoid these situations outright, she confronts them head on. Sometimes, maybe a little bit overkill. Sokka, on the other hand, is a lot more easygoing and is just down to try just about anything so long as he can learn something from it. Okay, I must come clean, because I did lie a little bit when I said I don't think Sokka's tale really explores loss. Because in a way, I absolutely think it does. Not in the form of the other tales where they've all lost an explicit someone, but rather in a loss of self. Later, with Sokka's master, we see this explored a little more. With him wanting to undergo the training because he felt like he's just some dude on Team Avatar while everyone else is a bending master. I can't do anything. Each of you is so amazing and so special. I'm just the guy in the group who's regular. So in a way, I think you can interpret everything Sokka does, from poetry to his engineering prowess, as a form of finding that true self. For his entire life, he has wanted to be strong, just like his father was. But when he gets that opportunity to be just like him, he again fails in that last, last stretch. You but he still did the rest, right? All of those achievements leading up to that point shouldn't be invalidated just because he couldn't stick the landing. No one's a jack of all trades. And I think that is what his tale is all about. It's about being open-minded, about trying new things you might have never imagined yourself doing and not being afraid to fail. He can still be that brave warrior like his father was, but he can also be Sokka, the whimsical guy doing poetry, engineering submarines, and sipping on some good old cactus juice. So if you return to that healing angle throughout the episode, we've seen the depth of sadness and regrets, we've recovered with Aang's good deeds, and now we are laughing right alongside Sokka, who is just trying his best not to let his past define him. Which very nicely leads us into the tale of Zuko. Much like the rest of the cast, I think his tale is basically a concentrated version of his entire story, delivering both the happy highs as well as the very, very lows. At this point in the story, he is unaware that Aang too is within Ba Sing Se and seemingly he has found some level of peace. We of course get the whole whimsical angle of Zuko thinking that Jin is some sort of undercover spy while in reality she just likes him. But underneath that goofiness, I think his tale deals with this deeper sense of anxiety, not quite belonging, and generally feeling lost in life. After their, we'll call it, very slightly awkward date, they actually share a very touching moment of seeing the fountain and lanterns together. Even after the events of Zuko alone and him being entirely ostracized for merely being a firebender even if he wanted to help, he still lights those lanterns in hopes of just making Jin happy. For the first time since they've arrived at Ba Sing Se, and really for the first time since his banishment, he allows himself to just enjoy the moments. Only, he can't. Not really. After they kiss, he just begins to pull away and just rushes back to the tea shop. He tells Iroh that the evening was nice, but he does not elaborate. Much like Zuko himself says, the emotions here are complicated, because for that moment, he really was that Lee, or just Zuko. He wasn't the banished prince, he was just a guy helping his uncle run a tea shop who has went out on a date. But then there is that spectre looming over him, always pulling him back in. Just like we'd later see with Mei, Zuko's trauma is just what keeps him from opening up. The one time where he was truly compassionate and honest, he got, well, quite literally burned. And so it's only natural that he can't do that again. He desperately wants to leave that burden behind, but time and time again, he can't. 
Neither with Jin nor with Mei, Zuko could never be totally honest for the simple reason of him still not being honest with himself. Something we'd see on full display with Lake Laogai and of course the beach. So is him telling Iroh that it was nice what he really believes, or was it merely not to sadden Iroh? Considering the events of the Crystal Catacombs and how much those decisions haunt him later on, I think you could easily argue both ways. He might have enjoyed the evening and the time they shared, but much like with Iroh, there's a certain amount of resentment for himself in that. He wants to be happy, but why does he keep pulling himself away? Why did he rush away if it was truly nice? Why is he himself keeping him from enjoying these things? Much like the rest of the Avatar narrative at this point, I think Zuko's tale is one of transformation. It very blatantly shows us that underneath all of those layers and layers of trauma, there is still purity. There is still a teenager who can just go on a date and not carry around the baggage of the banished prince. But at the same time, just like his name that he takes from that boy, transformations are never easy. He has taken multiple steps away from the title of the Banished Prince, but even the name he has chosen for himself is still loaded with that regret. Even now, there is still a long, long way Zuko needs to go to just be Zuko. I think his loss isn't even a specified thing, but rather almost a state of mind. He's lost his mom, he's lost his family, he's lost his crown, he's even lost himself and goes by a fake name. He himself is lost and that is what his tale is about. But as with every great redemption story, he still needs to take one big, big tumble along the way, right? And on that somewhat bittersweet note, the series brings us right back to the very bitter with the tale of Momo. If Aang's story is one of desperation but hope, then Momo's is of utter helplessness and, more importantly, loneliness. You know how some people say that they feel infinitely worse about something that happens to an animal as opposed to people? I think much of that is because we perceive other people as these completely independent actors that can, to a certain extent at least, choose what happens to them. Of course, there are still plenty of things outside of their control, but when compared to animals and especially pets, they just have a lot more autonomy, right? With animals, we immediately have this preconceived sense of helplessness and I think that is precisely what the tale of Momo leverages. Much like Aang, he dreams of finding his lost buddy, but with him being a smart lemur but still a lemur, it almost seems like the world itself is just stringing him along just to leave him disappointed time and time again. He tries searching further but gets ambushed, then made out to be a circus animal and eventually just captured outright. It again just embodies that helplessness of the search. It's like he's caught up in this current that he can't fight back against, much like what we saw with Appa's actual capture in the desert. Though seeing this disgusting hypothetical of what might have happened to Appa, Momo frees the pygmy pumas despite being chased around by them just a few moments prior. He misses Appa, but more than anything, he's scared for Appa. Though as much as he might have made a few new buddies, they just take the bit of Appa's fur and lead him to the massive paw prints, giving us a final shot that might just rival Iroh's. Much like Aang, there is a degree of hope in Momo's story. He does meet a few new buddies after all. But unlike Aang, the conclusion is not a happy one. Purely practically speaking, Appa's paw print is of course a very explicit indication that next time we'd be seeing the tail of Appa, if you will. Or in other words, following his footprints, or I guess paw prints. But the shot of Momo just sleeping in that hole perfectly conveys that sense of loneliness that he, Aang, and even Iroh are feeling. All he can do now is just hold on to this shell of Appa. The only indication that he may be close, the only source of hope. He might not feel his physical warmth or be close to him, but this is the best he has. And so he sleeps there, even in the rain, all alone. It's like holding onto a pet's toy after they've passed. It is a desperate desire to just fill that empty hole that's been left behind by something, anything. But just like we saw with Iroh, there really is nothing you can do. I think the reason why this pseudo-filler, slice-of-life-like episode resonates with so, so many people and is easily among the best of book two is because it gives us these deeply personal looks into each and every one of the main players and how they manage different forms of loss. In many ways, it takes us on this roller coaster of emotion that is just life. It gives you a stoic story about forging your own name, but then it follows up with one full of deep regrets. It allows us to hope and heal, but then it drops us into this fog of uncertainty and leaves us there all alone. The Tales of Ba Sing Se is a moment of transformation for the story and for us. Without Appa, we are quite literally grounded and are forced to think a whole lot more about who we are. 
In the city of walls and secrets, some choose not to show their true faces just yet, while others open up for what might just be the very first time. It ties together everything that came before to guide us into what comes next, shown very explicitly with Appa's paw prints. It might not be an episode filled with action or explicit story developments, but it's an absolutely vital one for the bigger story of Avatar. The tales of Ba Sing Se tell us to just slow down, to reflect, to look around and appreciate the little beauty in this world, to enjoy the short moments of joy and to just feel, because it's only in accepting your past that you can begin to look forward. And that's the video. Oh boy, I can't believe we're actually here. You have no clue how long this was in my drafts and just how many times I've reworked it. It started as a 30 minute video on Iroh alone. And to be totally honest with you, I was a couple of seconds away from scrapping it again. But then I realized that it would just become a development hell cycle, so here we are. This was always a really special video I wanted to make, so I hope you enjoyed it. And with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my rambling, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.